already. Alrighty, so we've got about 75 people in here, which is a great turnout. Um, good afternoon and thank you everyone for tuning in from Australia, New Zealand and around the world. So um, awesome to see a few of our clients here as well in attendance. Uh, for those who haven't seen me before, my name is Asel. I helped coordinate the webinar uh, with the AIHS and Parkshire on behalf of Appinate. Um, if you don't know, we are Diamond Partners with the AIHS, and we have sponsored today's free webinar showing Parkshire's Council's journey to ISO 45001. So for the format of the presentation, we're going to be doing 45 minutes presenting and 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, I know a lot of you have some questions, so we might have a little bit of overflow there too. Um, and as we go through the webinar, you can chuck your questions into that Q&A box and our panelists will be reviewing those. Um, we won't be actively monitoring the chat, but if you have any comments as we go, um, feel free to just uh, jump those in there too. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Anthony and we'll get this show on the road. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks, Aisel, and uh, welcome everyone to our little presentation. Um, and also thank you for the, making the time to come and have a look. I know we're all busy and it's always good to find out what else other people are doing in the world of safety. Um, I understand this session is quite heavily subscribed, so I think there's quite some interest in this subject matter, which is great to see. As Asa mentioned, my name is Anthony. I'm the Executive Manager of Corporate Services at Parks Shire Council. And joining me today and presenting uh, a bit further down the track, uh, Tim Glogley, our Shire Presentation Coordinator. He works mainly in the Parks and Gardens open space area. And Patrick Williams, or Pat, he's our Executive Manager of People, Safety and Culture. And Pat's ultimately responsible for our safety systems here at Council. He'll give us a bit more of a rundown on, um, on the journey to accreditation. Um, so the outline of our presentation, or the uh, the broad outline is shown on that slide there. I'm going to give you a bit of information on what parks, or where parks is in, in our show. Um, and we'll base, we'll base that, um, we'll, we'll give you some information on, on our journey to accreditation and the tools that we use. And, and one of those was, of course, Appinate. Tim will come in, as I mentioned, to talk about how we use it in the field. Um, so he'll give you some practical practical uh, feedback and knowledge on, on how it works in the field. Um, I'll do some work on our, our bit of information on our reporting and how, how we use Appinate to support our management systems. Pat will give you the what's and all story on how we obtain and then maintain our ISO accreditation. And I'll wrap up at the end with some of the improvements and outcomes we've seen through our management systems. And uh, before we finish up, as I mentioned, on our um, Q&A session. So where is Parks? Parks is uh, in the centre of New South Wales, Australia, of course. Um, one of our key strategic uh, points uh, and points of difference for Parks is our location on the major rail link. So we're on the, um, we're on the Newell Highway that links Melbourne to Sydney, Melbourne to Brisbane, sorry and on the major east-west transcontinental rail line that links city to Perth. Uh, there is also a new rail line being, uh, being built between Melbourne and Brisbane, and that's the Inland Rail you may have heard about. <clears throat> so our, as I mentioned, our locality is our, our major strength and where we see our future. Um, our shore itself uh, is bounded by, by the shore of Lachlan, in Narromine to the north, um, Gabon near Orange to the east, and Forbes to the south. Um, we're between the Lachlan and Macquarie rivers. Uh, we're, we're far enough away to avoid the major floods, or so we thought. Um, the major rain event that affected Yugara also impacted uh, quite a number of um, houses in our, in our shire this time, for the first time we've ever we've seen some flooding as well. Um, Parks is also famous uh, or named after Sir Henry Parks. Sir Henry Parks, of course, is the father of Australia's Federation, although he didn't live long enough to see it happen. He was the Premier of New South Wales and a strong supporter of, of free education. And here's a statue in our main town square of Sir Henry and shows him in full oration, holding a book in reference to his advocacy for free education in Australia. 
Our major tourist attraction is, uh, of course, the uh, world famous radio telescope or the DISH. That's a wonderful tourism destination, only 15 kilometres from parks, and it uh, welcomes over 100,000 visitors a year. Our other major um, destination event is, of course, the Parks Elvis Festival. We just celebrated the 30 years of the festival, only two weeks ago in January. And yes, that's me, and that's my real hair. <laughs> I recommend you, you put, uh, put the Elvis Festival on your bucket list, for any, if you haven't already been, that is. A little bit more information on the Park Shire itself. Um, we've got a population of around 14,600, uh, average age of 41 years, 39%. Um, well, our population are couples with children and uh, 6,700 6, dwellings and 5,800 household residences. Uh, the other wagon wheel slide there is our um, industries by employment. So you can see it's pretty evenly spread across quite a number of industries, the major ones being agriculture, um, health and, and, um, and so on. Mining is also a major contributor to our gross domestic product. As I mentioned earlier, our key, one of our key points of difference is our location where, as I mentioned on the east-west rail line and the, and, uh, and the main road, between Melbourne and, and Brisbane. And so a number of freight logistics companies have already set up in our region or, or just near our township. And that, uh, that was called the Parks Hub in that area. Uh, we're only an overnight truck ride to over 80% of Australia's population, that being in Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney. And as I said, our strategic location on the intersection of the New York Highway uh, that connects Melbourne and Brisbane and the rail corridor that links Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney and Perth, as well as Adelaide and Darwin, we see us playing a crucial role in freight uh, and logistics for, our, for future years to come. Um, since then, though, the state government has earmarked quite a large area of land to the west of parks called the Special Activation Precinct. Uh, they were declared and identified by New South Wales government to bring together planning investment to drive jobs in the economy. This means a business to be able to establish and grow in regional New South Wales, having the confidence to knowing that, that the planning frameworks are already in place. Um, so that means that if, if, for example, a road freight business wants to set up a major industry, then all of the planning approvals have already been done. And so streamlines that, streamlines that planning process. Uh, as you can see, this, this dwarfs the logistics hub that we had previously set up in that area. So it's quite a large, um, quite a large area as you see there. It's almost three times the actual logistics hub is dwarfed by three times the size of the special activation precinct. There's already a number of industries built in that area, including Master Pet. Um, and there's a couple of other major announcements, including a uh, plastics recycling plant coming online in the near future. So all of this investment will impact on our economy and it does um, impact on our ability to deliver our services. So um, I'll just give you a little bit more information on, on what services councils actually provide. I'm not sure what the, um, the spread of industries here listening in today, but, but often we get interviews or people coming to interviews about council and don't realise quite the diverse um, range of businesses or, or functions that we provide. Um, so these next two slides just give you a bit of an outline on, on our 11 um, major uh, uh, activity areas. Um, so here we see we're, we're a regional, regional council, we're, we're medium sized, but our capital budget was quite a bit higher because of the significant amount of grant income we received as you can see there, the capital has been 83 million, which is quite a bit higher than it would normally be. And that's because of a couple of major projects, including a, a water supply pipeline from Forbes to Parks, where we get most of our water from. As I said, we're many businesses in one. Um, and we've, as I said, we've got 11 principal activities. Um, just quickly, family daycare, caravan parks, 70 commercial leases, uh, we, we manage the corporate services function, IT management, which over a thousand devices, some of which we use for Appinate, which we'll go into a bit later on. 
uh, and also PCs, HR. We've got a fleet of 160 vehicles and we manage or maintain 206 council building buildings. Build, build. <coughs> we run um, economy and tourism, uh, as well as the iconic festival I mentioned, the Elvis. Um, we also support emergency services and there's 30 buildings just there alone, as well as many rural fire trucks. We've got four libraries, uh, open space in which Tim works. There's 25 parks, 15 sports grounds, 75 generally open space areas, five cemeteries, four swimming pools. You get the idea. We, we do more than just the old roads, race and rubbish. Uh, and the unique thing about rural councils is that we often supply water and sewerage, sewerage schemes as well. So without going boring with all that detail, I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot of what our higher risk activities are. Here's a picture of Timmy Bowen and one of our council graders. Um, graders these days are linked up with GPS systems to help guide their construction activities. Uh, so just to quickly outline those major higher risk um, work health safety areas that we identified. Uh, so construction works, drainage works, we run a fleet depot, we own stores, we maintain roads and footpaths, uh, parks, gardens, recreation, sports facilities, as I mentioned, water and sewer supply. So rubbish or waste management, um, range services, including um, animal and dog management, and I mentioned the, the major festivals. So next section here, we're just going to quickly go through how we got to where we are today. Um, and Pat will go a bit later on in a bit more detail about the accreditation piece. But from, from where we were perhaps 10 years ago, um, we were self-assessing ourselves. So we, we tended to be we tend to be pretty optimistic and positive about how our safety systems were going. Um, uh, I've been at council long enough and we're going back a few years now, but we've actually had three deaths uh, here, at, here at work and they occurred in our workplace. One was a drowning uh, at our treatment plant and there was a helicopter crash that killed, killed two weeds management staff. I know our senior management spent some time in court being cross-examined about our safety systems way back then and I know that that's, that left a lasting impression on them. As I said, these incidents were quite a number of years ago. Uh, around, I think, nine years ago, we conducted an external review of our procedures and practices against the New South Wales work health safety legislation and regulations. And that revealed a number of areas where we just weren't doing very well against that standard. So in response, uh, and it was coming from our senior management down, so, so we've always had good, strong support from senior management with our safety system. So we appointed a business improvement officer uh, and his job was to concentrate on safety area, on safety improvement. Uh, to help him, we appointed a consultant um, to guide us through the process of creating a, a management system. Uh, and we, at that time, based it on the 4801 Australian standard. So between the two of them, um, they got to work and, and started to put together a, a new management system as I said, based on that standard and also on the, on the legislation that New South Wales Work Health Safety um, comes under. Uh, to start off with, they, they work with our teams. And as I mentioned, Tim was involved with that right from, that, from the start. Um, that was to understand the risks associated in all the different work areas and, and what safety controls they had available. And also to have a look at what things we may not have, may not have thought about as well, and we documented all those into safe work method statements and standard operating procedures and so on. The, the next part is, so what are we going to do? How are we going to manage all of this data? And at the same time, we, we, also, we also were conscious of the need for a tool to help us to track and manage all of this information that we needed to ensure compliance with our systems. So we decided early that we needed to digitise that process. Uh, so it, with the introduction of our new management system, we included a tool and that tool we selected was Appinate to document all of our, our forms for us. Um, it, we set about creating quite a number of forms. We mainly concentrated in the beginning on those higher, 
player activity forms. And Tim will go through those shortly with you on what, what they were. Uh, we had a pretty good support from Appinate, and we've found over the years now that there's, there isn't really anything that we've needed uh, that we couldn't do with, with their forms tool. Uh, so, the, so the process we undertook was um, we designed a few forms and then used a pilot process with the Parks and Gardens team. Uh, we provided iPads to all the teams and uh, they used that to access the Appinate app. Um, where, the, where we have parts in our shire that don't have mobile coverage, but the Appinate um, app can store the form data and then post it up to the to the cloud platform when the device comes back in range. So these electronic tools also helped us incidentally when we implemented our new enterprise system because the teams were already used to using electronic safety forms. They easily transitioned into using electronic forms for their timesheets, for example. So uh, just to give you a bit more um, information on how those forms are used in the field, I'll, I'll get uh, Tim to just um, take over now and he'll, he'll just go through some of those key forms uh, that we use when we're, when we're out in the field. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Ant. Um, yeah, as Ant mentioned, I'm Tim. I've been with Council for around 19 years. So when I first come on board, WHS has changed a lot. Um, from the paper-based system that we had, um, yeah, it, it was hard to find. You had books in trucks and then they were stored each week, um, taken to the office and then they, they were boxed up there and scanned in later. And then to, to re-find and um, access them, that was pretty difficult. Um, so yeah, just how it all started, we sat down with the WHS teams and um, teams from all departments um, had different workshops. We identified um, a lot of the hazards and then also discuss control measures. Um, once that was all put into these forms, uh, the Parks and Gardens team that I was involved with, we ran a pilot with the electronic devices. Um, just a, there was a few issues, I guess, as you're changing you know, a system that old into a new area and change uh, the older staff you know, to transition it was a bit harder. We had to spend a bit more time with them. Um, it was daunting for them using tablets for the first time. Um, but once we sat with them and went through it uh, and realised all the forms and how, how easy they were to understand and use, everything really went pretty well, pretty, um, pretty good with all the departments. Um, so just I'll talk about a few of the main forms that we use as well. So first up is the plant pre-start. Um, and as you can see here, it's just a checklist um, where you run through, um, select your plant, your item of plant, if you're trained to operate, uh, and then you run through the checklist. If you select anything um, as not okay in there, that automatically gets sent straight to the workshop and straight to the supervisor for review, um, which works really well. So any, and especially any safety concerns, um, come straight up and then that's addressed before plant leaves the depot. So um, that really works really well. And another major part of that, which streamlines it is the, um, so the service schedule. So you've got in hours um, or kilometers in there as well and service due. So that's automatically booked in for service as well, which runs pretty smoothly. Um, next one's the WASP, which is a work activity safety permit, which are our uh, risk assessments. Um, again, the, um, there's some real great points about this. Your time, date and location of your workplaces is all um, stored in there. Um, also, any swims relating to the task that you're doing are preloaded in there, so they can all be accessed easily. Um, once, once you select the hazards um, that are applicable to the task you're doing, the preloaded control measures come up so they're easy to check off. Um, and there's also a further spot for comments and to add um, any extra hazards or controls that you might use. Uh, also, once the WASP has been completed and uploaded, 
it's sent to the relevant supervisor for review, which is great, um, a great way for them to monitor works as well for supervisors if they don't get around all the teams every day. Uh, they can still see what's happening. Um, we encourage, there's a spot for photos as well. So before and after photos to be included in there, which is a, um, great for the supervisors to review as well. Um, next one I'll talk about is a go see, which is um, a worksite audit. Um, so again, we do this on our teams as well as contractors. Um, you just go through, check, um, check off the area you're working in, the activity, and then that also gets stored in GPS location and time stored in when it was done. Um, yeah, you check the teams and contractors have completed their um, safety requirements. So such things like the plant startups, their either WASP or risk assessment, they have their selected control measures in place. Um, and then, yeah, a discussion on site with them to um, put into place the control measures they may, may not have in place that they've checked off. So it's another good system. Um, also say incident notifications. So any incidents that happen, there's uh, notifications done straight away. Supervisors are notified straight away and then um, that uh, form then or incidents placed into a category one or two um, of severity and then task for um, investigation. Um, everything gets stored and when you want to recall it, so for the investigation, you know, it's just so easy to grab and run through um, for when you do your investigation. So the last last one we use a lot then is the, that investigation form. Um, yeah, so it's, it's again, so you go through and um, go through the incident, go and, and get the root cause, talk to um, all involved. Um, it's a great way to go through it as well. Um, you get to the root cause and then can come up with control measures. Um, as you can see there in that form, you then put in the, the um, actions from that, from that report and then task and put a responsible person and a date to be completed. Um, and again, there's the easy access to find everything. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much, I think, the forms I, I deal with, so. Yeah, great, thanks, Tim. Um, just while that screen's up there, they're, they're examples of some reports that are produced using the template system in Appinate. So, so the data is collected using the form and then when it's sent out to the staff or the supervisor or whoever, it's converted into a template using, a, in this case, a Word, a Word template. So it's merged in and then, and then emailed around. So that, that leads nicely into the next section on reporting. So all this data is being gathered and, and then it's stored into the Appinate cloud. Uh, and from the cloud, administrators can, can um, access the information. So, so here, here's an example of, of the actual dashboard from Appinate. Um, from here, as I mentioned, we, we can use this platform to create the forms or modify them. Uh, we can review the data, as you can see there in the middle, there's a little icon showing the forms that were filled out and where, where they were completed. Um, so you can review that from this portal. Um, you can export data from here, as I said, using a, a Word template or, or the built-in templates. Or as we've done um, with, with the information that Tim mentioned, it's being gathered uh, we can add connectors to a form that automatically trigger and send, send information to all sorts of different directions. Um, for example, we can email direct to the fleet um, foreman if there's a problem with a, with a plan, plan item, as Tim mentioned. So, so those are, they're called connectors and they just, they can fire off uh, and send data everywhere. Um, more so, and I just want to quickly mention one of the tools that we use. It happened, they certainly has a lot of tools. Um, uh, this is uh, the sync add-on that we use. So when data is added and sent to the AppNet platform, we've identified some forms where we'd like that data to be stored on our local 
database, in this case, a SQL Server. Uh, so the Appinate sync add-on uh, is, is loaded onto the server and the form is then just pointed, pointed at it. And anytime somebody um, adds data to a form, it automatically then appears in a table on our local SQL Server database. Um, so some of the key features of this, I mean, it's quite, a, quite an amazing little tool. It, you just create a form in Appinate and point it, point it to the, the global REST connector and it automatically creates the table on the SQL Server database and it'll automatically add and change fields as you add or change the form. So it's quite a, it's quite a powerful little tool. Um, some of the examples we're using it for here is our monthly performance report. And uh, it shows here um, just the change in, in the number of different types of events that, that might have been reported. So Tim mentioned incidences. Um, so there, there's the list of um, the events for December. I think. So there was a bit of a snapshot on, on where things are going, hazards and near misses and so on. One of our largest areas is um, we, we use the event form for other things other than safety, so public public liability or public property damage. We also record those using this form, and that's important. I'll show you why in a minute. Um, another type of um, reporting I wanted to mention, um, and I, I know Parks may or may not be aware, I've been a long supporter of the lean methodology. And one of the tools in the lean toolbox we like to use is um, the safety anyway, is visual management. And here at the depot, you can see an example of a visual board that our fleet manager uses. Um, it's for our depot compliance activities. So each of those activities is allocated a document holder and those activities are then are distributed over the year and each holder has the details on the front of it to say what's required, how it's recorded, any contact information for the contractor or staff member that may be required to complete the task. And when it's actually done, the card in the holder is just turned around from red to green. And so straight away, you can see where we're up to with our compliance and safety just at our depot. Uh, each one of those folders attracts things like um, eye wash inspections, uh, and then those are using an Appinate form, uh, slings and ropes, uh, ladder inspections, first aid box, heavy vehicle inspections that are required, such as our, our uh, van for our childcare, um, heavy vehicle, as I mentioned, pressor vessels, um, electrical cords uh, in our workshop, that sort of thing. So just sort of maps it out and you can kind of straight away see where we're up to in terms of the compliance with, with those safety measures. Uh, the next section uh, I'm going to hand over now to Pat Williams. I mentioned Pat's our People Safety Culture Manager. He's going to um, take us through, take you all through our journey to get accreditation. So over to you, Pat. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, hi guys. I'm Pat Williams. So I've uh, been with Council for roughly two years in HR, and I've recently taken on this executive role um, about six months ago. So I'll discuss with you our road to ISO certification. So as Anthony briefly mentioned at the start, so in our WHS journey, so senior management gave us the challenge to achieve ISO certification within the three years. Um, during this process, we appointed that one FTE to help with that business improvement in WHS. And we engaged a consultant to assist with that implementation. Um, so we developed that management system in consultation with our workers. So part of that process was getting them in, talking about our risk registers, our processes, our procedures, how we do things and going from there. And then after that point in time, we got a fully documented system that we had a, manuals, a manual with our forms and procedures. So just to start with, why do you want to get certified in terms of your ISO? So the main thing really is it drives continuous improvement so it ensures you're always focusing on improving your whs and your risk and regulatory requirements um, it helps you be less reactive so you're always at the forefront um, focusing on moving forward and your continuous improvement 
Um, it reduces those unforeseen incidents and non-conformities. So again, it's ensuring you're focusing on the forefront, it's continuous improvement moving from there. Um, it does improve our employee engagement with WHS. Um, processes are clear, employees are aware of what they're required to do. Um, we end up with better systems and better processes in place. Um, you can get a competitive edge. Um, so you get that ISO logo um, attached to your business. It gives you that element of trust. Um, it can assist you with tenders and proposals and contracts. Um, so you can point to your ISO certification and say, hey, look, we're compliant with uh, WHS best practice. Um, and also you achieve that consistency and transparency. Everyone knows what they're doing. You've got that continuous improvement again. Um, we support best practice. Um, it's transparent. People can access it. They can find forms. Uh, it's quite good on that front. Um, in terms of choosing a certifying body, um, there's a lot out there. So I think there's 100 or more accredited certification bodies out there. We um, currently use SIA Global. Um, so there's a few things you need to consider. Um, so ensure that they're accredited. There's an um, uh, organisation called JAS, JAS, sorry, ANZ, Joint Accreditation System of Australia and New Zealand. So all certification bodies in Australia need to be accredited um, and you can check on their website to check if they are or not. So just make sure that um, aligns with you. Um, the reputation of that body, so make sure it aligns with what you require. Um, check what your competitors, suppliers, clients use. Um, uh, if you're a global company, some of these are globally um, certified or accredited bodies, some are just national, so work with that. Um, the specialisation of that certification body, so make sure that they know your industry and go from there. Um, experience, so you can check with them and especially when they're doing audits, they'll send you all the auditors resumes and where they're at. Um, from our perspective, um, that consistency and experience with the uh, auditors that we get, we've had the same auditor for the last six or seven years turn up on site. Um, the best thing for us is they know our system, they know our practices, they know our procedures. So. They can guide you through that. So if you do get that up front, check um, how long they've been with the company, if they stick around, uh, what industry they're in. Um, if you're looking at integrating your system, so we are only OSO 45,001 uh, certified. So um, we are looking at the other um, accreditations and certifications, but if you want to integrate, make sure that that body can do that. And obviously price, so we're all looking for a good price. Um, I'll go in a bit more detail in terms of hours a bit later, but it all kind of varies in terms of um, the size of your company, how many sites you want to get certified, those sorts of things. Um, so what to prepare for? So most of the certification bodies, they'll assist you through the whole process. So it's in their best interest to get you certified. So they will help you. Um, but obviously you'll need to purchase the standard and have that on file. Um, undertake your training to build your expertise and capability. Um, most of those certifying bodies will offer the training. So in terms of getting basic knowledge, what the standard is, implementing the system, there's auditing courses as well. Um, you'll need to perform a pre-assessment or a gap analysis on where you're at um, in terms of your systems, policies and processes. Um, and then that'll all reflect back to that standard. So. Um, where you need to be on that process. Um, and part of this, you'll then pull together that manual. Um, it'll set out how your business is going to go operating forward to make sure you meet that. And that's in that process, that's when we consulted with all our staff. So would they assisted us with developing our risk registers, those risk controls, safe worth work method statements, all our processes and procedures. And, and then that's what got put together in our big manual. Um, and then certification audits. So generally, depending on which uh, certification body you use, they generally do do two audits before you actually get certified. So a stage one audit, which will then help you identify any further gaps. Um, and then a stage two audit, which is more detailed and quite thorough um, to make sure you cover all those um, standards from there. And then obviously you get your certification straight after that and go from there. 
Um, in terms of maintenance, so there is a fair bit of maintenance involved once you actually do get uh, certified. So like we said, when we initially implemented, we had that one FT and engaged a consultant. We maintained that um, and had a WHS officer and a consultant assist. We've recently increased that to two FTEs just um, based on that and with a bit of consulting support on the side for that. Um, there's also a big commitment from management because you will be adopting a continuous improvement approach. So you could have that WHS officer or team in place, but management will have a significant involvement, especially in the forms of uh, risk management and control measures and that sort of thing going forward. So you need to get that from the start. Um, our auditing requirements, so it's quite thorough. Um, there's two audits undertaken every 12 months. Um, we have an internal and an external audit and the external audits are conducted by the certification body. Um, and depending on the results of the uh, external audit, uh, usually you'll have 12 months to address any of the minor non-conformances within that. If you do get a major, it will add on an additional external audit, which will be a follow-up audit, which needs to happen in the three months. So. Um, it'll go from there um, in terms of audits. And then recertification occurs every three years. So that's part of the external audit for that particular year. Um, and then the certification audits, usually in a bit more detail, um, and they get go a bit more thorough um, to make sure you can be certified and you're following those standards. Um, in terms of costs, um, so resourcing costs, um, we, like we said, we have the WHS staff, we've got two FTEs, and then we've got consultancy on top of that. Um, internal audits, we do engage a consultant sometimes with our internal audit. Um, that's just to do a bit of impartiality. Otherwise, we usually get either our health and safety reps or someone from another department to uh, help with the audit, um, just to make sure it's a bit impartial. Um, external audits and recertification, um, it varies. So it varies on how many auditors you use, how many days they need to be on site, um, whether they're going to conduct it on site or remotely. Um, so just to go through that in a bit more detail, or, and we also, sorry, subscribe to the ISO standards, that roughly costs us about $10,000. We subscribe to all of them. Um, so that's why we get it. Obviously, if you're only going to subscribe to a few, it might be a bit less. Um, in terms of our audits, so we have seven sites that we have that are ISO certified, just to give you a rough idea. Our external audits take anywhere from about eight to 10 business days, and we usually have about two auditors. So those 12 monthly audits, they could cost roughly around $15,000 for us. Um, and then the certification audits, so the big ones, they're anywhere from 25000 to $35,000. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, they also certify it with the right bodies and that sort of thing following on from that, and it's a bit more detail. Um, and then that also depends if it's remotely or on site. Um, and if you require follow-up audits, so that three monthly one, if you get any major non-conformances, it can add an additional cost because obviously they'll need to conduct another audit. Um, that usually costs around four four thousand roughly, if we go from for that one. Um, and then just to outline our audit, so if you go to the next slide, in, mate, um, we recently completed our recertification audit um, last year in October. Um, so just to give you an idea where we're at, we received two major non-conformances and then quite a number of minor non-conformances. Uh, the majority of these were administrative related. So um, basics around some of our risk registers hadn't been updated. We couldn't provide evidence that swims had been, people had been trained in their swims. Um, and then the big one was our, we couldn't provide evidence of our corrective actions. So if from an in inspection or an investigation, uh, a corrective action was lodged, Sure, it may have occurred, but we uh, we couldn't have that evidence to back that up. So um, that's a big part of it. So I've added in there a bit about what we learn. So a big thing, rubbish in, rubbish out. That's what we call it. So if you put rubbish into your system, you're going to get rubbish out. So make sure you set it up to what you need it to be. 
Um, so make sure it's simple, easy to use, um, easy to navigate. Um, the software system which we use for our corrective actions, it's not Appinate, just by the way, um, it's sometimes it can be difficult to locate those information. So especially when it comes to an audit, it's very hard to get that information for the auditors. Um, we then have consistency. So in our WHS area, we've had a bit of turnover. I think a lot of people have had a bit of turnover recently, but particularly for our WHS, it's made it a bit difficult to maintain that consistency and momentum uh, with our system. So that's part of the reason why we got those major non-conformances. Um, and that also flows into training. So make sure you train your staff, uh, make sure they know the correct processes and go from there. Otherwise things might fall by the wayside. Um, big thing, if you write it in your manual, make sure you do what you say you will. Um, that's what the auditors pick on. So if you include a process or a procedure that's nice to have or it's a bit unreasonable or over the top, um, the auditors will grab it because they'll just say, you said you were going to do this, but you didn't do it. So then you'll get a minor non-conformance for that. So when you're doing your manual, just for me, stick to the standards, make sure it's consistent with that um, and work from there. And then evidence, uh, evidence, evidence, evidence. So if you don't have it be in the auditor's eyes, they'll say you didn't complete it. So um, that's the great thing about Appinate. You can get photos, you can get documents, you can upload it all in there. It's a good document management um, system as well in terms of adding those parts to your form. So if you do have a corrective action or an incident, you add photos to it. Um, add that they did their toolbox talk, whatever it may be. Um, it, it really helps in this process. Um, On-site versus remote audits. So we initially did a remote audit. Um, we found it very difficult in terms of, uh, I was recently new in the role as well as uh, our WHS officer was. So it made it difficult. They focused a lot on our admin side of things. Um, and if it found it difficult to locate, it really frustrated the auditors. So if you're going to go remote, make sure your admin side's really up to date. Um, likewise, if you're going on site, they're on site, they'll walk around, they'll notice things go from there. So make sure your sites are um, pretty up to scratch. And then the other thing was, like I mentioned, the auditors, they're there to help. They actually want you to get your certification. It's in their best interest to do so. If you get someone that's consistent, been there for a while, um, they'll know your systems and processes as well. They'll help you through the process. So it can be daunting, but uh, the auditors, they actually want to get you through and make sure you get certified. So um, make sure you lean on them as well to help you out and they'll give you some good feedback as well. So um, thank you. That's me for the moment. Cheers. Okay, great. Thanks, Pat. So just to, to start wrapping things up, I um, just want to take you through some of the benefits we've seen um, with, our, with our safety systems. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we, we record everything, including uh, public liability incidences. So, so here is a case here at our waste facility. It's a general waste area. The, the, you've all seen this, at, hopefully, at your local tips. Um, so you back up to the wheel stop there circled in red, and you dump your rubbish into a skip bin. In, in our case, it's all general rubbish, I guess, put in the landfill. Uh, but uh, we received a number of incidences at that location. Uh, the first incident was uh, a person stepped too close to the edge and they slipped between the skip bin and the lip of the, of the uh, unloading area. And the second incident was when someone actually tripped on one of those wheel stops, so they backed in jumped out of the vehicle, walked around to empty it and tripped on the wheel stop. Now, both incidences only, only resulted in minor scrapes and scratches and bruising. Uh, but we had a look at it and we come up with an engineering solution to, to eliminate the risks there. And, and uh, this is what they decided to do. They um, put in a, uh, they took out the wheel stops and put in this uh, folding folding ledge or folding um, uh, cover, which, which folds up to cover the gap between the, between the skip bin and the ledge, and then folds back down when they're replacing the skip bin. Uh, so that, that was um, immediately noticeable. And there's been no further incidences at that site since that was done. So 
So that's an example of, uh, of improving our own facilities based on incident reports. Uh, Pat's gone through the accreditation outcomes. Um, um, I think we have one of only very few councils that have actually achieved and maintained this accreditation. Um, so that, that's helping us. And the other way areas it is helping us is in lost time injuries. So it's a industry standard measure of, of um, lost time injuries. This is uh, from the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey of local councils. Um, um, doesn't, they don't interview all councils, but all of the councils that they did um, record on, our FTP injury rate per 100 employees, as you can see there by the, the trend line, has gone from 109 lost in time injury days per 100 employees down to eight last year, last financial year. And the, uh, the orange line above that is the New South Wales state average for councils. So they're at 119 lost time injury days on average. Uh, so there's one significant benefit and I'll just get Pat to run through how it impacts on our, our premiums. Over to you, Pat. Thanks, Ed. So it has had a good uh, impact on our premiums. Uh, based on that, we're using our claims performance measure, which is basically based on our wages and then our um, base uh, premium. Um, and then our previous claims as well. So we have had a reduction the last year that uh, increase. We had a couple of long-term claims and also a legal claim that came through. So that's what bumped that one up. But uh, particularly over the last five financial years, um, since we've implemented the ISO certification, we have seen a good reduction in our number of claims. Um, and it's also been good for our return to work and how that's kind of... Uh, been working so it's been some good outcomes there Tim. okay thanks pat and thanks tim and that uh brings us uh, to the end of our our presentation i've put in the slides and, and they'll be available and sent out after this um, session by the, by the industry group so um if you want to contact us later on there's there's our names there i'll, I'll give them our contact numbers as well we we'll put a couple of websites uh, links there if you wanted to follow up on some more information. Um, so now is an opportunity to go through some of the questions and answers. So perhaps Asel or someone could go through them with us. Thanks, guys. Awesome, Anthony. Yep, thank you for putting all this together. It's a hell of a lot of work. So um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, if we do run over, feel free to stick behind. Um, the, the webinar will be recorded for the length of the full length of the time. Um, and let's start off with a question from Steph. If the challenge was set, and this is for Anthony, um, if the challenge was set by executive leadership to gain certification, it sounds like you had some great support from the top. Did you have any roadblocks within the council to get the ball rolling to implement new systems? Uh, not, not within the council, the normal uh, change of management um, KVS applied. So Tim mentioned some of the guys were apprehensive about using tablets. Um, uh, you know, we, we know, we, I think we get it. We need to be safer in our work. Um, so I think that that also helped. Uh, but you're right that the top management commitment certainly was a, a big um, driver for this to work well. As I mentioned, we, we they also provide the resources. So having a consultant and a full-time person on, on the implementation process really helped as well. Yeah, Kath, so Kathy from Casket Cas Consulting, um, she, she was a big part of that implementation process. That's right, yeah. Mm, great. Um, so a question from Stephen for Tim. Uh, have you found that doing all the work on site during the job normalizes safety work during the day? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think um, all our teams are trained right from the start and they're all aware of what, what's expected of them. Um, yeah, and, and going on site and especially doing the go-sees, um, yeah, everything's, everything's done. Um, a lot of our contractors or the contractors that I use and manage um, that on site during their job really um, helps, helps them as well. I've also had some of those guys go to some electronic forms um, from their paper-based stuff, but they know what's expected. And if they, um, yeah, they know we're coming around to have a look and we go through it with them. So yeah, I think it, it definitely 
um, makes it part of their work day. Awesome. Uh, question for Patrick. On the benefits of ISO 45001 accreditation, do you find that an added benefit as a council is a knock-on effect on external service providers and contractors on improving their WHS performance? Um, yeah, I believe it does. Uh, we do require like the obvious WHS information from our external providers if they're doing a project or a contract with us. Um, we also occasionally, like with the go sees, we'll go out on site and make sure they adhere to what we require from our systems. So, um, and then obviously our project managers are pretty good on that front in terms of uh, going out there, shutting down work if they need to, that sort of thing. So, uh, and we hold them a bit to a higher standard. So, yes, yeah, so I, I believe it does. Um, obviously, you still get some rough and ready customers, but um, I, I think we do have a, um, a pretty good. Uh, track record of improving that so yes yeah it's definitely easier when you have that rigidity and the data to back up you know um, the assertions that you make uh, question from larger m uh, i think this is one which a lot of people are asking what led you to use appinate what were you looking for in your digital management system and what other systems did you consider uh anthony you want to take that one yeah thanks Rachel. so i guess uh, this was um this was probably, as I mentioned, about seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, and I remember at the time, iAuditor was around. Uh, I think it still is around in some form. Uh, but it just wasn't, didn't quite have as, as much of the, the um, functionality that we needed. Uh, and I, I just simply Googled, <laughs> Googled it and uh, found, found Appinate. And it, I think it provided us some... Um, Free, free use, so we could we could test it with a couple of forms with a couple of users, and and we guess we build on it from there. Um, um, so so this, as I said, it was um, nine years ago, um, and and we've stuck with it ever since. Um, so did we do an extensive um, cost benefit analysis on all the different options available? No, not really. Um, uh, but um, have we chosen the right tool? And I guess to make a point, um, Appinate is a tool. It's not a safety management system. It's our safety management system that we used Appinate to, to build around. So, so all of the forms and the way they, they link together and how they're reported and, and so on is, is our safety system um, on top of using the tool as a framework, I guess is another way to put it. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was the form builder. Uh, that we used our consultant, Kaz, as, as Asa mentioned, to help build all those forms and tie it all together into a system. Awesome, Anthony. Uh, question from Paul. Uh, this might be one for Patrick. Uh, was your certification across the whole council or just the maintenance team? Uh, it was across the whole council. So it's our system in terms of our processes and procedures that we have in place. So that, uh, yeah, accounted for the whole of council. It includes uh, things such as our risk management profile across the whole council, how management does its review, our legal requirements, those sorts of things. So it was across the whole council um, on that front, yep. Yep. Uh, another one for you, Patrick. And uh, I know you already answered this question, uh, but continuous, and this question from Karen, continuous improvement can be obtained via internal audits of your OHS MS. Was this not a consideration? And do you do internal audits of that system? Yeah, absolutely. So we do the, there's internal audits. We do that every 12 months. Um, that is part of our certification as well. So we need to do an internal review and then the external review as well. Um, I believe someone else asked who does those audits. Um, so we were lucky enough that we've had internal people that are trained in auditing, so they have done that. Otherwise, we get a consultant involved, so they um, they can help with a bit of impartiality or we use a HSR or um, someone along that front to assist with those audits. Yeah, so definitely. Great. Uh, question from Shane. Uh, how has transfer and digitization of existing documents uh, pre-system been progressing um, in order to assist both council staff and auditors? Uh, Anthony, do you want to take that? 
uh, existing documents pre-system. We're going back nine years. Um, and considering back then the number of forms we were using then compared to now is uh, yeah, chalk and cheese. Um, so uh, uh, we, we just, we didn't bother with the digitization of transfer, we just um, uh, stored them, archived them basically. But they were only things like um, uh, plant pre-start checks and it was very basic, the systems we had back then. Um, so I so say, no, we're, we're, not, we're not back backdating our the documentation digitization of those older records, no. Alrighty. Uh, a quick question from Stephen. Uh, he, he's asking, can we just run through the roles of the all of our Parkshire panelists today? Um, Anthony, if you want to jump through that. Sorry, yes, yeah, so I'm executive manager for corporate services. So I was um, involved with safety and we had a bit of a restructure and, and since then uh, the safety role has been added to people. And that's why Pat's involved now. Um, and I also have an IT management background. So that's why um, I was involved with the selection of the tool. So uh, currently, though, my role is um, uh, governance, risk, and uh, IT, uh, IPNR reporting, corporate reporting, that sort of thing. Uh, Pat, over to you, mate. Sure. So I'm the yeah, executive manager of people, safety, and culture. So yeah, I recently took on safety. Um, before that, I was looking after just the HR team and payroll. So of taking on safety requirements from now. So HR included in that, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm the Shire Presentation Coordinator. Um, so I work with in the Parks and Gardens section and I look after the um, sporting fields, open spaces, parks and gardens. Um, yeah, so I've been through there, parks and gardens, a few different positions, but started off from there and as the arborist and then worked through in supervisors positions and then recently moved into this coordinator's role. Awesome, thank you, Tim. Question from Christy. Uh, do you use any other metric to determine your safety culture? Um, E.g. Hudson's safety culture model. Uh, Anthony, you want to take that? Uh, no, but that's a good tip. We might have a look at that. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Cool. Uh, I think uh, we've got plenty of quite technical ones here. Uh, one, one of them has already been answered. Um, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, Patrick. Uh, does the investigation module align with ICAM methodology? Uh, yes, it does. So we've got two investigation methods. So there's category one and category twos. Um, category one's generally our sort of low level investigations and category two is our hot level. Um, we use the five whys just for our category ones and then category two, yeah, it follows the ICAM message. So with Appinate, we find we can alter it as we needed. So um, yeah, we follow that ICAM for those high level investigations that we need. So yes, we can. Cool. Um, from Peter, uh, and this will probably be for you as well, Patrick. Will, we, will you be looking at 45003 certification as well? Um, and also, thank you for sharing your experience. It's great to get practical examples. Uh, no, not at this stage. Um, I think we're considering of doing the integrated uh, management system, but we haven't gone down that path yet. So, yeah. Hmm. Cool. Uh, question from Shane. Uh, I think yeah, also for you, Patrick. Does the council use anything like what three words for incident notification? i.e. location, location of works, um, does it tie in with Appinate if, if used? I think that's specifically asking about instant notification. Uh, no, we don't use anything like what three words. Um, in terms of location and location of works, um, there is a GPS part included in Appinate, so we can find that location if we need to in location of works, um, but no, we don't tie in any other um, software as far as I'm aware. So. Yep, I've uh, got plenty of questions for you, Patrick, here. So um, Jason has asked, was the 4501 accreditation in conjunction with uh, 9001 and 14001? Uh, did you consider an integrated man management system? Um, and also some more questions on, was there a CBA? Uh, is there a payback period inside of two years? 
Um, so no, we haven't done the integrated management system. Um, our environmental officer is really keen on getting involved in that. Um, but we no, we haven't gone down that path yet. So we've just got the four five double zero one accreditation so far. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All righty. So a uh, question for, for, for Patrick again. Uh, does the Parkshire Council use the state cover Be Safe system? Uh, no, we don't. We only purely use that for claims management, pretty much. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, question from Matt. Uh, Tim, if you want to jump on, on this one, on this one. Did digitization of the safety management system uh, increase or decrease safety documentation? Um, I guess it's it's stayed the same. We still do the same forms. Um, maybe the increased with the, the go sees. We didn't do that before, as far as I'm aware, on a paper based form, there, did we? Mm. Yeah, so it, it might have just increased it slightly, but um, I think that the way and how easy they are to use, um, it hasn't made it harder. I don't, I don't think it's it's not the not the Appinat system. It's it's our management system, and and we have added a lot more features to it, oh. which does require a lot more documentation. So yeah, absolutely. But they're all mostly electronic now, so so there's more of them, but they're easier to fill out. Ready? Okay. All right. Uh, I think. Another, another quite similar question, and this probably be for Anthony. Uh, has the council performed a program evaluation, um, i.e. what has been implemented, if it matches what is happening in the field, and is it actually reducing risk um, post-certification? And I think that probably ties in with your injury kind of management and your insurance, yeah. That those last couple of slides that show the reduction in lost time injury and the reduction in the increase in claims, um, is, is where we're seeing it and we can demonstrate the clear benefits there. I saw another question that talked about uh, the payoff um, return on investment. I, I guess it's a bit hard to answer that one because of uh, the change, the different sites without understanding your exact circumstances. For example, Pat mentioned we've got a safety system and we also uh, certified uh, seven other sites, uh, you know, it changes depending on your own situation. But it's pretty clear that the reduction in lost time injury and the reduction in the increase in claims is, is where we're seeing the benefits. I guess, um, as Tim's kind of alluding to, we're getting um, you know, a better commitment from staff as well. Um, cultures, cultures seems better around safety. Um, yeah, we, we seem to be getting now from a period of uh, moving into a period where people aren't afraid to talk about hazards or, or report incidences now. So, so I guess that's another sort of softer benefit, but, but sort of ties in with the, with the culture piece. Great. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's quite a few questions here, and I've noticed we've still got 90 people out of the 150 or so that attended. So it looks like you know people are really paying attention here. Uh, how long did it take you to transition the organisation to the ISO accredited system? Uh, and that's from making the decision to move forward to receiving accreditation. Uh, Anthony, three years. It was a three-year, I think, process. So the, the the goal set by management was within three years we will achieve the in that case, in that time was a forty-eight hundred one standard. So so it was three years, and that includes the preliminary audits, so and the desktop um, evaluation and so on. So so yeah, three years all from go to work. Alrighty. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, three year process. Eh? And uh, okay, at Anthony from Stephen, uh, sounds like this has given you a pan site benefit in maturity. Sorry, what was that? It sounds like this has given you a pan site benefit in maturity. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a question or a statement? 
I think, uh, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm not too sure pan pansite means, but um, yeah. <laughs> Across site, I think you mean. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All righty. And a uh, question from Karen uh, What is your organization's EFT number? Uh, Pat? Uh, mm -hmm. We roughly sit around 240. We've got a few vacancies at the moment, but yeah, about 240 FTE. Yeah. All righty. Cool. Uh, I think uh, this might be one from uh, for Patrick. Could you provide an overview of the types of reports or data um, that can be extracted from the Appinate system in order to identify opportunities to eliminate injury or illness? So I think that's related to those last couple of slides. There. Yeah, so there's a number of reports we can get out. So obviously you can pull out the individual forms as they come through. Um, I think you can get data in terms of uh, uh, how many reports we've had, those sorts of things. Um, that have come through and then also we can pull out specific little areas which say the corrective actions that sort of thing so most of them you can pull them out I think as PDFs or as Excels um, we pull them out as Excels as well to then manipulate if we need to to get some extra data um, Ant also talked about that SQL that's a bit over my head but he's IT so he loves it um, and then that pulls out the data from those in terms of how many total we've had, injuries, hazards, near miss, public liabilities, um, and goes from there. So as long as uh, what you require, you've got a data point in there that can pull it out and then can manipulate those fields, yeah, you can get some pretty decent reports come out. So, yeah. Awesome, guys. So I think, uh, you know, we're a bit past now. I know uh, you guys have all got a lot of things to do today. Um, you know, we, we had this webinar delayed, you know, by the floods um, over in parks. Um, it's been many months in the works and uh, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot, a lot of information changing hands. So really appreciate you guys putting your heads together to, to make this all happen. Uh, thanks everyone for coming in. There's still 60 of us here. So um, nah, it's been great to see everything here.